The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at www.peerview.com forward slash UZM. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to Hyatt Regency and the CAP conference here in uh, lovely Chicago. Um, I'm your moderator, Robert Anders, and uh, I'll be introducing each of the speakers uh, as, as they come up. Uh, we're absolutely delighted that, that you're here today, and we're uh, very excited to, uh, to present this program to you because we think that uh, this is really what pathologists need to know. This is where pathology is heading. Uh, this is changing how pathology is being practiced. It's what patients need. Um, the uh, companies are marketing these ideas to patients, so the patients are actually coming to our oncologists and saying, what is my you know, uh, mutational status of this particular gene? And um, you know, we're really the people who are responsible for being able to, um, to answer those questions. Okay, so today's... Um, Today's seminar is going to be uh, the central role of biomarker testing and piecing together the immuno-oncology puzzle, uh, essential guidance for pathologists to maximize the potential for a cancer immune therapies. Um, <clears throat> so today's panelists are myself, uh, Dr. Robert Ferris, and Dr. Lauren uh, Ritterhaus. So we've put together three cases here that I hope are not too unfamiliar to you in the practice of pathology. So the first is a 55-year-old uh, individual who undergoes a lung resection of a five centimeter, it's a single five centimeter tumor. Surgical margins were negative, and there does not appear to be any local extension into extra structures. Um, the lymph node status is multiple ipsilateral lymph nodes, um, and hyalur nodes show malignancy. And if you pick up your AJCC staging manual, um, that cancer would be staged out as indicated there. And the question that we have is what additional, if anything, uh, therapy, uh, testing do, does this patient require? Here's an example of that. It's, so it's non-small cell lung cancer with uh, quite a bit of squamous differentiation there. The second case is a 55-year-old individual who underwent resection of a colon cancer. Um, they had a single uh, right-sided five centimeter tumor which was removed with uh, negative margins. Tumor grossly violates the visceral peritoneum and multiple lymph nodes were positive at the time. Two years later, this patient now presents with persistent uh, multiple peritoneal metastasis which were confirmed by FNA to be adenocarcinoma. The original staging was uh, as indicated there. Now obviously it's a metastatic disease. Uh, here's the FNA showing uh, sort of textbook adenocarcinoma, uh, sufficient to make the diagnosis. And then our question is, uh, what else does this patient need? Before they see the oncologist or when they're in the oncologist suite, what's the likely questions that uh, the oncologist is going to have for you? And then the third case here is a 55-year-old patient with a history of malignant melanoma. They uh, present with dermal masses at the location of previous resection. Excisional biopsy shows malignant melanoma, as indicated here. And again, the questions that we're posing to you is what other uh, tests, if any, does this patient need? Okay, we will return back to those specific cases, and, and hopefully um, you'll be able to, to uh, answer those questions. So now we're going to look at um, navigating the immuno-oncology biomarker landscape. And our first speaker uh, will be Dr. Robert Ferris, who's the director of University of Pittsburgh uh, Hillman Cancer Center. And he'll be talking to us about immuno-oncology 101 for pathologists and keeping up with clinical evidence for immune therapies and biomarkers. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Anders. Uh, pleasure to uh, be here and uh, have a a uh, great task, but a difficult one to give you um, the overview of um, immuno-oncology, which is a rapidly changing uh, field. And, um, uh, but I think if we can review some of the data, uh, you'll have a good sense of where the field is and where it's going, uh, and that will help because the biomarkers are becoming really crucial aspects of our decision-making in the clinic. Uh, 
So uh, I just uh, think everybody's aware that the field has been really transformed. Uh, for those of us who've been working in this field for 20 years, uh, you know, we didn't uh, tend to get these uh, nice uh, meetings in the middle of the middle of the sessions with wonderful dinners. We were in the basement. Uh, this was before anything worked. Uh, the food was usually stale. Um, you know, people didn't show up. It was just five or ten of us convincing each other it would work. But now it's the um, it's now the uh, promising uh, development of the year. So uh, we've come a long way, uh, but I think it's just the beginning. Uh, and this slide kind of makes that case that uh, whereas we were trying to get immunotherapy to work, uh, we now are really trying to uh, surmount the challenge of how to integrate it, uh, how to select the right patients. Uh, it's truly the fourth modality, uh, and we have FDA approvals. It seems like every few months, another disease and another agent. So uh, I'll try to outline where uh, immunotherapy fits uh, and uh, uh, how do we select patients and integrate into conventional therapies. Uh, I think uh, first and foremost is to convince uh, some of you perhaps who uh, need to see some data for why the immune system is important. Uh, and uh, this was uh, a, one of those sort of uh, simple uh, and yet um, I think very elegant studies uh, by uh, Jerome Galan uh, in 2006. Pretty simple study here on the left. You can see the traditional staging system. Jerome uh, is in Paris, so they use the UICC TNM system. Stage one does well, stage four does poorly. But if you reassort these patients based on the content of the tumor, based on lymphocyte infiltrate, and uh, uh, Galan and others have shown that it's not just quantitative, but there are actually geographic locations and a memory phenotype of these lymphocytes. But a high frequency of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes was associated with good prognosis, almost regardless of stage. Whereas, again, almost regardless of stage, if that tumor had a very poor lymphoid, uh, lymphocytic infiltrate, uh, those patients did poorly. Uh, and the goal, of course, of immunotherapy is to take patients with poor lymph lymphocytic infiltrate, stimulate their <coughs> uh, adaptive immune compartment, uh, and move them up to a good prognosis uh, uh, population. So uh, a little bit of background, uh, just to sort of remind uh, all of you that the T-cell response is the key anti-tumor immune response. That's what we're talking about. And T-cells are triggered through the T-cell receptor. Uh, we call that signal one. The T-cell receptor sees the uh, antigen, which is the MHC and the peptide complex. Uh, that's a trimolecular complex. Signal one's not enough. The T-cell receptor signaling requires a co-stimulatory signal. And for a long time, we thought that that uh, was generally a positive signal and it either existed or didn't exist. You either got the second signal or, or, or not. But then we began to understand that there was actually a very finely tuned second signal, that co-stimulation has uh, a number of different receptors and ligands to sculpt uh, and create uh, a uh, appropriately stimulated immune response for the situation that the immune system needed, whether that was a viral infection or uh, a tumor, uh, or uh, perhaps uh, to uh, reduce and induce a, a tolerance uh, and avoid uh, activation. Signal three uh, is uh, cytokines, uh, and they also uh, shape the immune response. Then, uh, and I think uh, as we'll see shortly, signal two got even more complicated. Uh, in addition to co-stimulation, there uh, is signal two that is co-inhibitory. And shown there in the red are two of the most famous co-inhibitory signal twos, uh, PD-1 and CTLA-4. And uh, these send negative signal two. Uh, they can overcome T cell receptor signal one activation. And so it got very complex. And so this is a nice uh, slide uh, for us to try to uh, demonstrate uh, and uh, uh, get across how the immune system works. It's much like your car. So I went out, uh, put on some red shoes, uh, and wanted to uh, uh, illustrate this. Uh, actually, I uh, got this from uh, Jed Walchok. I don't think these are his shoes either. So if you think about it like a car, if you get in your car and you push on the accelerator, but the engine is off, the car's not going anywhere. You have to turn on the engine. <clears throat> and so some patients have a baseline endogenous immune response against their own cancer. The engine's already running. Others need to have it triggered, and we can trigger it with vaccines. We can stimulate an immune response by forcing it with adoptive cell therapy and just transfer in, uh, just turn on the engine. But the engine turning on is not enough. 
uh, as you know. You have to push on an accelerator, and we have some agonists. We have positive signal twos, those co-stimulatory signals. That's kind of the accelerator, cytokines, uh, toll-like receptor agonists, and so on. And then what I told you was the more complex aspect of signal two turns out to be, I think, one of the transformative discoveries uh, in the past uh, 20 years, uh, which is that uh, the breaks, the inhibitory mechanisms actually dominate in the immune system. So the, you need a positive signal, but the inhibitory mechanisms are more potent, they're more redundant, and I think that's the, uh, the uh, reason that there's two feet on the brakes. And as you know, you can take one foot off the brakes and the car may not even go. Sometimes you need to get both feet off the brakes and really allow the car to move forward. So we'll see examples of how multiple redundant negative signals, negative signal twos, co-inhibition, need to be removed, re taking off the brakes. And those brakes are called immune checkpoints. So we need to overcome immune checkpoint uh, uh, inhibition. So is the immune system important? I told you that lymphocyte infiltration is a, a good prognostic marker, but the tumor has already escaped by the time they show up in the, in the clinic with symptoms. One way that happens is through escaping signal one, downregulation of the HLA antigen processing machinery, and this is a, an important pathway because it operates in series. So an antigen gets degraded in the cytoplasm, and this pathway operates in series, so any one step here can block antigen ultimately getting to the cell surface. And so t tumors have uh, demonstrated many paths to block signal one. Here's an example of the cancer genome atlas. This is particularly head and neck cancer because I worked on this area. And you can see uh, this mimics lung cancer, this mimics melanoma, where there are, uh, at baseline, tumors that have mutations in the HLA and the antigen processing machinery. And in fact, although these numbers look low, 8 to 10 percent, Tony Rebus has shown us, uh, a melanoma medical oncologist, that resistance to immunotherapy leads to outgrowth of some of those uh, HLA mutant tumors. So that's a, uh, an, an immune escape mechanism uh, that will be a barrier to a successful immunotherapy. So it's not just the tumor cell uh, that has escape mechanisms. There are other cell intrinsic pathways uh, that lead to uh, a suppression. T cells uh, can be suppressed through co-stimulation, co-inhibition, and also cell extrinsic inhibitory uh, uh, features such as suppressive T cells called regulatory T cells in the red, Treg. And those Treg send out uh, membrane-bound and soluble factors that turn off those uh, conventional uh, cytolytic T cells. There's also myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So there's cell intrinsic and cell extrinsic uh, mechanisms of suppression, and the tumor itself can drive much of this uh, through a number of features, secreting those uh, signal 3 cytokines like IL-10 and TGF-beta, uh, uh, gobbling up all of the oxygen and, and glucose in the microenvironment, and making it hard for those T cells uh, to function. So we need to understand these immune escape mechanisms because each of them is a therapeutic target, and we need our colleagues in pathology to help us characterize them, and I think they will become more and more uh, keys uh, as biomarkers uh, to drive our decision making. So I tried to make the point that uh, this negative signal two co-inhibition is complex, and it's not only complex, uh, but it's redundant. Uh, I think what you can see here is a number of these inhibitory mechanisms through uh, PD-1, PD-L1, LAG-3 is inhibitory, uh, uh, BTLA and CD-160 bind uh, to TIGIT, TIM3, there are multiple layers of inhibitory signals, and the, that's the bad news. The good news is that once we understand them, we can create therapeutic antibodies to disrupt those inhibitory signals uh, in the clinic and overcome uh, T cell dysfunction. Just to give you an idea of how potent uh, the uh, regulatory T cells are, the dominant transcription factor for uh, Treg is called FOXP3, uh, and there is a syndrome of uh, a hereditary uh, uh, dysfunction in FOXP3. Uh, this is called the IPEX syndrome. And so if you have dysfunction in FOXP3, that transcription factor, you don't have regulatory T cells. You don't have suppression, and you have basically unregulated autoimmunity uh, characterized uh, by uh, a lot of features uh, of autoimmune attack. Uh, and we can actually reproduce this uh, in mice. Uh, 
This will become important because FOXP3 drives Tregs, and some of the immunotherapies in the clinic are trying to accomplish the same thing. And so we see some of those autoimmune side effects and adverse events, not as bad as a genetic deletion like these uh, heritable syndromes, but uh, that explains some of these uh, uh, features. And you can actually transfer back in regulatory T cells. And here's a picture of a young boy. We recruited a Treg expert named Dario Vignali from St. Jude, and he t uh, brought this picture of a boy that they treated. Uh, and uh, there is a, uh, the parents gave a waiver uh, for us to show his face, and so did the parents of this mouse that was also cured uh, by Treg transfer. So don't want anybody to think we didn't uh, get all the paperwork signed there. So what got us into immunotherapy? Uh, uh, you know, when we were toiling away before we got these uh, wonderful evening seminars. Well, it was that we were tired of getting FDA approval for a chemotherapy or some sort of agent that improves survival just by a couple months, uh, and eventually the patient uh, met their demise. Immunotherapy, as we all know from childhood vaccines, can last for decades. So the goal was to use the immune memory for durability and long-term potentially actually cure, not just delay progression by a couple months. And so this was the theoretical benefit, was that uh, tail of durability. And then if that would work, and that's where we are today, as we've demonstrated that it works, now how can we move it into the mainstream uh, with conventional therapies and improve uh, ultimate cure? So what are the immunotherapies that are approved? Well, we've talked about signal one escape, but most of the uh, available immunotherapies in the clinic are signal two escape. I told you that co-inhibition or the breaks. So they take off the breaks uh, and this exhaustion induced by PD-1 or CTLA-4 can be reversed by blocking uh, those uh, inhibitory signals, these immune checkpoints, and the two most famous are CTLA-4 uh, and uh, PD-1, and they have therapeutic targets. And in fact, as you're aware, uh, last week they were awarded uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, Hanjo uh, discovered uh, PD-1 and cloned it. Uh, Jim Allison uh, discovered uh, CTLA-4 uh, and uh, primarily indicated uh, its role uh, as an inhibitory molecule. Uh, and uh, just to point out, I think there are some disappointed folks, and so they may not be listed on the Nobel, but a lot of people contributed to the immune checkpoints, both on the receptor side, PD-1, and the ligand side. There are two ligands. Uh, and so I'd like to point out that these folks, you know, they only allow three names for the Nobel, and you just can't fit everybody in, but a lot of contributors there. So we talked about durability. What happens in the clinic? This is the expanded access program for uh, ipilimumab, which is an anti-CTLA-4 antibody. And just look at the scale. We're up to 10 years here. And so if you're disease-free at two or three years, this is incurable metastatic melanoma, and you've got about a 20% long-term cure. So if you're doing okay at three years, those folks are generally not recurring. So pretty impressive for a cohort of 5,000 patients, and of course there's many more now. Whoops, I went the wrong direction, sorry. So um, one of the unique features of immunotherapy, as I showed you with, uh, with the, the mice and the uh, uh, baby with IPEX syndrome, it's not like traditional chemo where you get bone marrow suppression. What you get is autoimmune attack. When you take off the brakes, there is nonspecific anti-self reactivity, rash, uh, colitis, uh, and uh, liver endocrinopathies, et cetera. And there are unique kinetics. You can see that sometimes when you block uh, the uh, immune checkpoints, uh, you get actually infiltration, as we hoped, with lymphocytes, and the tumors grow, both clinically and radiographically, before they eventually improve as those lymphocytes that have infiltrated the tumor are killing off those cells. And these kinetics can actually be seen uh, in a small number of cases that have initial growth, so-called pseudoprogression, and then eventual tumor shrinkage. So, uh, Immune checkpoint blockade, overcoming that negative signal two is effective in melanoma where it was initiated, but what about other solid tumors? Well, uh, I am a head and neck uh, surgeon, and so we designed a uh, phase three trial uh, with anti-PD-1 nivolumab. We randomized it to the currently available options, which were pretty ineffective, methotrexate, docetaxel, or cetuximab. Uh, and we um, used an overall survival endpoint, which the FDA likes. This is very interesting, now coming to some of the biomarkers, that uh, when we looked at those pdl one positive or negative based on a 1% threshold, interestingly, although response was better in the pdl one positives, overall survival looks about the same. 
about 25% uh, at a year and a half, uh, and those numbers look pretty similar. So what's going on with a pdl one negative tumor responding? Uh, and I'll show you that, but I first want to show you how the pdl one negatives, as you follow over time, get better and better. So the hazard ratio, uh, no benefit is one, it's less than one is good, 0.89 is a modest benefit. These curves barely separate. That was six months of follow-up. Now when you wait a year of follow-up, the curves begin to separate. The hazard ratio improves, it gets lower. And then now the curves are clearly separating. The hazard ratio of 0.73 is a 27% reduction uh, in risk of death. So even though pd one was not expressed, an immune response is dynamic. And over time, you can induce immunity and generate clinical activity. And part of that is because the immune response is not static. You actually have uh, not only delayed responses, but you can have delayed and adaptive resistance because PDL1, the ligand, is not just expressed at baseline, but uh, is regulated by uh, the uh, interferon STAT uh, pathway as well as uh, the MAP kinase pathway. And so over time, resistance may develop as well. Now, this just demonstrates that uh, the higher the expression of PDL1, the more likely there is to be a response. Uh, this is in the nivolumab anti PD1 arm. We didn't see that in the chemotherapy arm. So, PDL1 is a predictive biomarker. But it doesn't just get expressed on tumors. Uh, this demonstrates that tumor associated inflammatory cells or TAKES can also express PDL1. These are, we think, macrophages. And here's an example where uh, the uh, inflammatory cells are positive for PDL1 and the tumor is negative. And then here's an example where both are positive. Nice membrane is staining, um, and uh, the takes are also positive. So what happens uh, when you look at response to anti-PD-1? Uh, it turns out that as long as you have PD PDL-1 uh, on uh, the tumor or the inflammatory cell, the response rate uh, is around 18 to 20 percent, whereas the double negatives where there's no PDL-1 at all, those are the ones that we need to get the engine started. And in fact, in that uh, setting, uh, chemo did better than the anti-PD-1. Uh, Dr. Ritterhouse will talk about uh, uh, genomics, as uh, will Dr. Anders, but the uh, gene uh, expression profile quantifies the interferon gamma signature. Uh, how did we start the engine? Is there inflammation? And then there is the mutational burden, which generates uh, neoantigens that the immune system can recognize. So we've tried to uh, uh, in integrate this into our clinical practice with a couple of our uh, pathologists in Pittsburgh, uh, Liron Pintanowitz and Doug Hartman, uh, and they uh, developed an algorithm for an automated uh, uh, test for CD8 infiltration. They built a, uh, a computer-based algorithm and just uh, recently published that you could segregate patients with a 17-year median survival versus five-year based on a quantified CD8 infiltrate. And they're now working with our pathologists on how we can integrate this into our uh, standard workflow. So CTLA-4 and PD-1, I've told you, are the primary uh, uh, immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors uh, that, or that we want to target, but there's a whole menu, and they are coming. But I'll just show you the data for monotherapy versus, versus dual therapy, getting both feet off the brakes versus one. And this is melanoma, large study stratified uh, by uh, BRAF status as well as PD-L1 expression, treating with an anti-PD-1 or uh, plus an anti-CTLA-4, or with the monotherapy uh, plus a, a placebo. And what you can see uh, is that the combo therapy targeting both PD-1 and CTLA-4, taking both feet off the brakes, gives you better than either foot alone. This is response, 58% uh, almost response rate versus the monotherapy with PD-1 or CTLA-4. Uh, and interestingly, when you look at the biomarker for a 1% cutoff of PDL1 expression, uh, the, the best was in the PDL1 low, where you needed perhaps to get that engine started and trigger immunity. So the combo did better uh, when PDL1 was negative, where when PDL1 was positive, really all you needed uh, was a PD1 inhibitor. Um, now, that's important because using, when you take both feet off the brakes, you've got a higher rate of grade three and four adverse events. Those autoimmune effects come along for the ride and patients have uh, these side effects like colitis and pneumonitis. So we really need biomarkers to select those patients. That was melanoma. Uh, 
Here's dual targeting in lung cancer, CTLA-4 and PD-1, and you can see the, the uh, dual blockade with a 47% response versus 39 for monotherapy with nivolumab, uh, and um, nevo alone is 23%. So interestingly, this is where the field is, is trying to figure out whether you use uh, anti-CTLA-4 every 12 weeks or every six weeks, uh, but you can see the more that you uh, inhibit, uh, the more the clinical benefit. Of course, uh, head and neck cancer wasn't too far behind, and we target both uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1 uh, in different lines of therapy, and these trials are just completing, uh, particularly uh, in the uh, two phase three trials for first line and second line head and neck, where we target not just the receptor, uh, but in fact, PDL1, the ligand with dervelimab and tremilumumab is their uh, antibody against CTLA-4 versus chemo or monotherapy. So uh, big phase three trials reading out uh, in the next uh, six to 12 months in head and neck cancer. So immune checkpoint therapy, uh, in particular PD-1 blockade, improves, uh, improves survival in a number of uh, cancers. Uh, just most recently, uh, aggressive uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma received uh, accelerated approval. And we've got a lot of questions to integrate it with chemotherapy. Can you replace chemo? And how do we integrate with radiation? And the key and the point tonight is to understand how do we segregate appropriate biomarkers to personalize the immunotherapy for patients most likely to benefit. Thank you. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, um, biomarkers and pathology practice, specifically uh, PDL1, mutational testing, and, and mutational burden. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about are uh, currently approved biomarkers, PDL1, MSI, and MMR testing. Um, so, those are the two objectives. Uh, the first objective let's address is PDL1 as a predictive biomarker, Dr. Ferris already hinted at uh, how successful and sometimes not less than successful pdl one expression is. So tissue predictive biomarkers, we've been doing that for a long time. That's called pathology. Um, the first generation was the, the type of cancer mattered, right? That's what directed what type of therapy the patient got. Colon cancer is treated very differently than breast cancer. That was the question that the oncologist asked us, right? It's metastatic, where is it from? Second generation started focusing on the oncogenic uh, proteins, uh, her 2 new uh, expression, breast cancer, gastric cancer. Patient expresses this particular oncogene uh, product, then the patient's a, a candidate to receive a, a specific agent to block that oncogenic pathway. Now we're in the third generation, uh, immune contexture, the type, location, and even function of the immune cells um, are predictive of whether a patient will respond. How did we get here? Well, the first hint that PDL1 might be a predictive biomarker came from a study that was done out of my institution. All the PDL1 uh, assays were run uh, either by myself or Janice Taub. And what we found was that PDL1 expression was a 100% negative predictive biomarker. It meant that if a patient was PDL1 uh, negative, uh, they had no chance of responding. Uh, that was a small study, about 42 patients, mixed cancer types, m a lot of melanoma and, um, and renal cell in there, as well as some lung cancers. Um, so that is sort of what got the ball rolling, but when we look more broadly, um, what I'm showing you here is the overall response to PD-1 or PDL one blockade, all different agents lined up here, and for mixed tumor types melanomas, lung, everything thrown in there. Um, the red line shows you the patient response rate if the patient's deemed PDL1 positive, so you're about at 50% there. And if the patient is deemed PDL1 negative, the response rate's around 10 or 15%. So no more 100% negative predictive value. That's very important. That's not perfect, but it's pretty good. So PDL1 expression is an imperfect biomarker. Uh, of, of response to PD-1, PD-L1 blockade, but it does enrich for responders. So that brings me to this question. Would you recommend PD-L1 positive staining as a requirement for patients to enroll in 
the, in a clinical trial? The answer depends a little bit. If you're going to run a clinical trial and you're only going to accrue 200 patients and you need a certain response rate to, to, uh, to show that the trial is a success, then probably selecting for those responders is a great idea. However, if you're an oncologist, you know a pdl one negative patient has about a 15% chance of responding to immune therapy, and Dr. Ferris just showed you some of these responses, if the patient's alive by two years, they're alive by 10 years. And as an oncologist, my understanding is they don't want to leave patients behind. Um, so I think you know, the, 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 the answer here is a little bit contextual. Okay, how do you evaluate PDL1 expression? It's complicated. It's not like HER2 new. Uh, PDL1 can be expressed by different cell types, histiocytes, tumor cells, and inflammatory cells. It can be expressed on the surface of the cell or in the cytoplasm. And then the percentage of cells, there's a lot of regional or heterogeneity throughout the tumor in expression. All of these things are important. Unfortunately, they're all subjective, subjective, subjective. Um, evaluation of PDL1 is done by different scoring system. There's something called the tumor proportional score or TPS. The simple way to think about this, this is just the percentage of tumor cells that show membranous staining. You've got one in four positive there, that's 25%. The combined positive score sc scores not only tumor cell surface staining, but also any staining of immune cells. So we've got three cells positive there. The denominator here, not so intuitive, the denominator is now the number of tumor cells, uh, but nonetheless, that would be a 75% positive. And then the other is just flat out immune cells. You've got half of the immune cells positive there, you've got 50%. So there's about 10 melanoma cells on this slide. There's beautiful membranous staining of over half of them, 50, 60% TPS score there. Um, adenocarcinomas, much like Dr. Ferris showed in head and neck cancers, show a lot of staining not necessarily in the tumor, but at the tumor edge. And if you look very carefully at high magnification, in fact, the PDL1 is not expressed on these tumor cells, it's expressed on all these inflammatory cells, many of which are myeloid. Uh, we think these are the important cells to score. That's why the CPS scoring system encompasses these inflammatory cells. It's possible to test how pathologists are, are able to score these uh, different cell types. That was organized by uh, David Rim, who recruited a bunch of uh, pathologists here to see how well we could do in terms of reproducibility. Was there variability in the performance of anti pdl one antibodies? Absolutely. These are serial sections stained with an antibody, and you can see there's quite a bit of variability in staining. The good news is when Pathologists are asked to describe how many tumor cells are positive, the percentage of tumor cells that are positive. Our inter-observer agreement here is actually quite high. However, when we're asked to score immune cells, the inter-observer agreement is actually quite abysmal. Um, there's different types of tests. There's the implication of these tests are important. So there's something called companion and complementary tests. You can see the different agents here. Some have companion, others have complementary. What do these words mean? Uh, a companion test is used as a therapeutic uh, drug decision. A complementary test um, identifies patients that are likely to respond. So the way to think about this is in a companion test, Patients who test positive for a marker receive therapy. Those that are negative don't receive therapy. Complementary tests, positive, the patient will get uh, the therapy. Negative, it's a little bit up to the oncologist. Why do we have these terms? Where do they come from? It's because the FDA requires these tests to accompany the approval of all new agents. Um, so you'll see these terms used quite a bit. Take home messages, PDL1 is not a perfect biomarker. Um, Positive tumors are more likely to expand, uh, to respond to therapy. The readouts are primarily immuno, are in fact only immunistic chemistry. The interpretation varies by what platform is being stained as well as what the tumor type is. This is rapidly changing. There are going to be more of these inhibitors that we're asked as pathologists to evaluate. All right, let's go through mismatch repair and MSI. Uh, so this, of course, is uh, Lynch syndrome, or HNPCC, an autosomal dominant uh, cancer syndrome that is highly penetrant uh, throughout uh, familial trees. 
The idea here is that DNA needs to be replicated, and in that replication, it's uh, inevitable that errors will be made. The error rate for DNA polymerase is about one in 100 million. However, when this mismatch repair system is intact, the mismatch repair is much more like one in 10 billion. And if we have about three billion bases, that works out very nicely. People who are deficient in these proteins generate a lot of mutations. How many mutations? about 1,500. Notice that's um, about two orders of magnitude greater than the other tumors that are indicated here. How does this system work? So the DNA is repaired using these mismatch repair genes and their protein products. They bind to the replication fork behind the polymerase, scan along for mistakes, and correct them. We assay for them all the time using immunohistochemistry. This is a red chromogen, so the presence of these Proteins is determined by a red report in the nucleus. So this patient has all of their mismatch repair proteins. So how does this t team up to a microsatellite? So microsatellites are repeated sequences of DNA that are buried uh, throughout our genome. Uh, the significance of these, that these microsatellites are uh, prone to errors. So the DNA polymerase comes across what would be uh, this slippery segment, if you will. It's prone to stutter, induce errors. Our mismatch repair proteins come in, fix those errors. If there's a mutation in one of these, or, or the, if there's loss of one of these proteins, the patient um, repair system is not intact, so the DNA polymerase comes along, uh, slips along these repeated sequences. That re results in the DNA resulting in different lengths, and they can't be corrected because the system is inactivated. How do we test for this? We do a PCR-based test for these specific microsatellites, and when we see that there's widening of these specific peaks that are indicated here, that means that there's heterogeneity in the length of the DNA, and that's an indication that the microsatellites are of different lengths, and we infer then that the patient's replication system is then deficient. We can also test for these using immunohistochemistry for the mismatch repair proteins, and what I'm showing you here is a cancer that is deficient in these two proteins but contains these two proteins. So this patient would be reported out as mismatch repair deficient. Um, that led to a clinical trial, and um, I would like to remind you that colon cancer was not even considered for pdl one blockade from the first trial that we ran. There were 14 colorectal patients. Um, the overall response rate here was about a quarter, but none of the colon cancer patients responded until one did respond much later, but it was a complete response. When we looked at that histology, we saw typical MSI histology, dense in tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and medullary histology. That led to a, another clinical trial. And I'd like to remind you, there are 10 pathologists uh, listed in this. If you don't think pathology has a role in development of immune therapy, let this at least be some evidence that, that we do. I was fortunate enough to lead that, that group of pathologists. Uh, what did we do? We looked at patients who were mismatch repair deficient or not in colorectal as well as non-colorectal patients. What I'm showing you here are the objective response rates. These were ridiculous for this small number of patients. You've got, you know, two-thirds of patients showing objective responses and other patients showing stable disease. Uh, we were absolutely elated. Uh, this is another way of looking at the data. All the blue and black bars indicate that a tumor shrank, and those patients were mismatch repair deficient, and those that were mismatch repair proficient, largely the tumors increased in size. Uh, we didn't stop there. We took all comers and looked at 12 different tumor types. What tied them all together? microsatellite instability or mismatch repair deficiency. The response rates here were a little bit lower, but still 50% of patients responding was remarkable. And then you're talking about a quarter of patients with all of these different diseases showing a complete response. Uh, that was unheard of. The FDA did something they never did before, and that's they approved this uh, uh, PD-1 blockade. Um, for tumors not defined by histology, but defined by their molecular signature MSI or mismatch repair proficiency.
Take-home messages here, there are two tests, IHC and PCR-based testing that have nearly equal performance. Um, some institutions perform both. I suggest you perform whatever you're best at. Um, small samples tend to be much better for immunohistochemistry because simply there's not enough sample to get DNA. DNA-based testing also requires normal tissue as well as tumor tissue. Um, Large sample, large sample DNA-based testing uh, may allow for MSI as well as other cancer, uh, other mutations. Dr. Ritterhouse will address that next. And um, I'm not sure how to address uh, prioritizing uh, how you decide who's going to get tested for these, uh, for, for mismatch repair deficiency or MSI. You, we have pancreas cancers and prostate cancers in there that showed good response. Um, there's no method necessarily for triaging these. It's my pleasure then to, doc, to introduce Dr. Lauren Ritterhaus, who's the Director of Molecular Diagnostics at the University of Chicago. Thanks for that introduction, and thank you all for joining us this evening. So I'm going to be talking about um, really an emerging biomarker for immunotherapy, which is tumor mutational burden, or TMB, discuss um, how it's defined, the rationale for its use as a biomarker, look at it, its utility across a variety of tumor types, as well as some evidence for why it might be good for a biomarker. And then I'm gonna end with a little bit of data, some potential investigative immunotherapy biomarkers that are out there. So as we've already kind of gone over this evening, pd one and mismatch repair are really current clinical practice. These have FDA-approved indications um, and are used um, in the clinic today. Tumor mutational burden is really emerging. There are many labs that are reporting this. Um, however, it's still not widely available, but there's new data and evidence coming out really every month for its utility. This is obviously a very hot, active area of investigation. Um, so many different groups are looking at various different modalities of trying to find additional biomarkers that might help us stratify patients for these therapies, and we'll talk about a few of these. So TMB, uh, very simply, is just the measurement of the number of mutations that exist within a tumor. More specifically, it's the number of mutations that exist within the coding region of a tumor um, genome or exome. And it's usually thought of as the burden of non-synonymous mutations in an exome. So these are mutations that are going to actually produce the change in the protein structure. Um, and it's often reported as the number of mutations per megabase. However, some studies report it as mutations per exome, so you kind of have to be careful um, when you're looking at some of these numbers. However, there is a current lack of standardization regarding TMB. Um, various labs and groups are calculating it differently using different platforms. Um, and this is also really an active area of collaboration and investigation, trying to come up with ways to standardize the calculation and reporting of TMB. So there's just mounting evidence um, that TMB is a useful biomarker. Some of the initial studies we're looking at it is a biomarker in these immune checkpoint inhibitors that we've discussed in melanoma and lung cancer. However, there's increasing data in a variety of tumor types that we continue to see. And so the rationale for why this is a biomarker is similar to why MSI and mismatch repair deficiency is a good biomarker for immunotherapy, and that the larger number of mutations that you have, some of these are actually going to end up being expressed as altered protein structures, and these peptides are going to be processed, and at least a subset of them will be loaded onto the MHC for recognition by the immune system as a novel antigen that the immune system hasn't seen before. So the larger number of mutations you have to start with, the greater number of neoantigens you're going to generate and have the stronger immune system recognition of the tumor. Um, and in fact, there is evidence showing that the number of mutations that we see um, has a correlation with the number of predicted binding epitopes that are generated and recognized by the immune system. So one might ask if this is just a surrogate for neoantigens that are being generated, why aren't we using predicted neoantigens as a biomarker. And so calculating neoantigens um, is a much more difficult task. Um, it requires a lot of the neoantigens that are generated aren't necessarily part of um, tumor-targeted panels that we'd be doing. They're non-cancer-related genes. Um, and so you really need to look more broadly, so whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing. Um, and which ones are going to be loaded and presented on the MHC depends on the patient's HLA type. So you need to know HLA type of the patient. Um, and then RNA sequencing is also helpful to try to figure out which of these mutations are actually expressed. 
And so because of this, tumor mutational burden is a nice surrogate that's more approachable for use in the clinic and is actually performs quite well. So if you look at tumor mutational burden across tumor types here, this is tumors sorted from the left to right, from those that have the lowest average tumor mutational burden to those that have the highest here on the right. Um, you can see this y-axis is the TMB and its mutations from megabase, and note this is a log scale. So you can see across tumor types, there's a wide range of average TMBs that you'll see. And then even within a given tumor type, for example, in colorectal cancer, you can see there's a large range just within a single tumor type. And you can notice a few trends. In general, um, adult solid tumors um, that are associated with environmental exposure, such as smoking or UV exposure, these tend to have a higher TMB than a variety of other tumor types. And importantly, if you were to define uh, what high TMB is, and for the sake of argument, let's say here that it's a little over 10 mutations per megabase, that although there is a wide variety and range of TMBs across tumor types, at least a subset of many or most tumor types will have some tumors that fall into this high TMB range, suggesting that this might be a biomarker that could have utility um, across a variety of different tumors. And so in thinking about this in context to MSI, which we just discussed, um, as we saw some nice data showing that MSI tumors have very high mutation rates. Um, so what is TMB actually contributing? Are we just also identifying the MSI high cases? And you can see, in fact, there is a very large overlap. Most MSI high tumors will also have a high TMB. But there's a larger number of additional cases that will have a high TMB that aren't secondary to the MSI phenotype. And this overlap really depends based on which tumor type you're looking at. So for example, the overlap is higher in colorectal cancer. So this is some, um, one of the many studies. This is looking at non-small cell lung cancer. And this is um, combination immunotherapy. So looking at CTLA-4 plus PD-1 blockade um, in patients just with high TMB. And for this particular study, high TMB was considered 10 mutations per megabase. And you can see those patients that received the combination immunotherapy had much better progression-free survival um, than those that received chemotherapy. And like some previous data that we saw in head and neck cancer, uh, what was really interesting about this is this um, rang true still in the patients had negative pd one expression. So the patients that had less than 1% pd one expression responded really well to the combination immunotherapy um, in addition to those that had high pd one expression. So this is increasing um, amounts of data showing that pd one and TMB can really function as independent biomarkers and are you know, identifying different subset of patients um, that might be responsive to these drugs. And I really like this figure. I think it gets across a really nice point in that this is looking at a variety of different tumor types uh, um, with various immune checkpoint inhibitors and looking at their objective response rate in contrast to the median number of mutations that you see in that tumor type. And in general, the tumors that tend to have a higher tumor mutational burden respond better to immunotherapy, but there are quite a few outliers, and I think it's important to keep those in mind when you think about TMB as a pan-tumor biomarker. So for example, colorectal cancer, like we just saw some data, Colon cancer that is mismatch repair intact um, tend to not respond very well to immunotherapy despite having a moderate TMB score. Um, and then there's some tumor types that have lower TMB, such as renal cell carcinomas, that tend to respond better than you would have guessed based on their TMB. So there are definitely some outliers, and it's important to keep this in mind um, when think thinking about TMB across tumor types. So how do we calculate this? So all the original studies that looked at TMB did tumor normal matched whole exome sequencing. Um, and so this has really been considered the gold standard for coming up with a TMB score. And so any other way of calculating it really needs to show some sort of correlation with this method. Um, however, most clinical laboratories aren't doing matched tumor normal whole exome sequencing um, on a clinical basis. And so there's a desire to try to figure out if we can get this um, number by using targeted cancer panels, panels that are already being run in many labs today. And so there's some data suggesting that for at least the larger size panels, so in this particular figure, a 3 gene panel um, has a pretty um, decent correlation with whole exome sequencing, but the smaller panels you get in the more hotspot focused panels of 50 genes, 15 genes, those don't have a very good correlation as you might imagine. You're just sampling less of the genome to try to get this number. And here's some data looking at head-to-head -head sequencing of about 29 samples um, to calculate TMB with whole exome sequencing with match normal, 
and depending on this particular axon was around 50 megabases in size compared to a targeted tumor-only panel, and this was foundation one, which is a little over one megabase in size. And you can see that there is a nice correlation. It's not a perfect R-squared value, but many people find this correlation to be good enough to say, okay, we can come up with a TMB score based on this smaller targeted panel. We don't need to do a whole exome sequencing of tumor and normal um, to come up with this score. And so what are some remaining questions with TMB? Many of these have maybe popped in your head in, in some of the slides that I've been going over. And so what is a high TMB and how do we define it? Um, and depending on the study you look at, it's gonna be different. Um, some studies have shown, for example, around 200 mutations for exome. Some have defined it by the median for that particular cohort. Um, 10 mutations per megabase was that one study I showed you. And are there questions, um, should it be dependent on tumor type? Because I showed you there's a wide range of TMBs depending on tumor type, or should there be one number that's used for all tumors? So I think a lot of these questions are still remain to be um, elucidated, and more data is really needed to answer a lot of these. Um, and then what size targeted panel is suitable for TMB calling? I showed you some data suggesting that maybe a 300, 400 gene panel around a megabase might be okay, um, but what about a lab that has 150 gene panel? Is that going to be big enough? Um, and I think in general, in the field, people are pretty comfortable with around a megabase of territory or more, um, and things smaller than that, I know people are trying to use, but it kind of still remains to be seen um, how good that correlation is gonna be. And then if you're not doing match normal sequencing, which again, most clinical cancer labs aren't doing match normal sequencing, um, how should you filter ger rare germline variants? Because um, that can really affect your TME calculation, and that can be kind of tricky. And then what kinds of variants should we count to do the TME calculation? This is also being done differently by different group groups. Did you only include um, changes to protein structure? Should you include missense changes or frame shift changes? Um, and so this is also yet to be defined. And then how should labs go about validating their existing panels for doing performing TMB testing? Does it require everyone running 50 match tumor normal exomes? That's obviously a very costly and difficult procedure. And so these are kind of still a lot of the questions that are still being developed and fleshed out. Um, and then another one that's really important to think about, now that we think of using TMB perhaps as a biomarker for first-line therapy, um, turnaround time becomes an issue. Um, so while it might not necessarily be a separate test, um, we can maybe incorporate it into our existing NGS panels, um, but maybe a two to three week turnaround time isn't gonna be acceptable for oncologists for first-line <coughs> therapy. So this might require some changes to many laboratory workflows and how we batch and run things as well. So looking at some other biomarkers um, beyond TMB, there's quite a few investigational ones, many of them looking at the immune cell repertoire diversity, uh, whether looking at tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or myeloid-derived suppressor cells, um, looking at T-cell clonality, um, and some also exciting data is coming out looking at composite biomarkers, so combining many of these together. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of these. One of them, and we saw a little bit of data of this earlier, is looking at immune gene expression profiles. So this particular one is looking at an interferon gamma-related mRNA profile that predicts response to PD-1 blockade. They came up with an 18-gene T-cell inflamed gene expression score. Um, this was derived using a variety of different tumor types. The data shown here is in particular looking at head and neck cancer, but you can see it kind of segregates out the patients that responded and didn't respond. And in this curve here, it's shown to have a superior performance to pd one expression by immunohistochemistry. So looking at gene expression profiles um, has a lot of interest and promise for being a useful biomarker. And then as we've seen quite a bit of data, um, TMB and pd one can perhaps be used together in complementary biomarkers um, because they really can function as independent, particularly in some of the tumor types, such as lung cancer, as shown here. And so for first-line non-small cell lung cancer, obviously the treatment algorithms are really evolving, but perhaps you can perform both TMB and pd one and that can really help um, direct what um, therapy can be given. And finally, I think um, there's a lot of really neat data in looking at multiplexed um, protein-based expression and immunohistochemistry in addition to generating really beautiful images such as these. And so 
like we saw earlier in a lot of the data, there's a lot of different of these immune checkpoint inhibitors and these pathways they're putting on the brakes. So can you look at many of them all at once in the same cell? Can you look at the inflammatory cells at the same time? And can you see how they're actually interacting with each other, the stroma and the immune cell repertoire and the tumors, and kind of look at it all at once to get a better picture of what's going on? And there's a lot of really exciting data um, here as well. So to summarize, TMB is a promising new biomarker associated with response to immune checkpoint inhibitors in several different tumor types. Um, and TMB doesn't necessarily have to be a separate test. It can be incorporated into a lot of current existing um, NGS-based cancer panels. And it can be complementary to pd one and perhaps most useful as, as a composite biomarker. However, there's still a lot of questions remain um, as what the best method to calculate it is, what's the appropriate cutoff criteria, um, how is it going to be used clinically? And then biomarkers in general for immunotherapy is a very hot area of active investigation with a lot of different modalities being um, looked into, including composite biomarkers. And so we'll all have to stay tuned um, for all the exciting advancements. It's my pleasure then to, doc to introduce Dr. Lauren Ritterhaus, who's the Director of Molecular Diagnostics at the University of Chicago. Thanks for that introduction, and thank you all for joining us this evening. So I'm going to be talking about um, really an emerging biomarker for immunotherapy, which is tumor mutational burden, or TMB, discuss um, how it's defined, the rationale for its use as a biomarker, look at it, its utility across a variety of tumor types, as well as some evidence for why it might be good for a biomarker, and then I'm going to end with a little bit of data, some potential investigative immunotherapy biomarkers that are out there. So as we've already kind of gone over this evening, pd one and mismatch repair are really current clinical practice. These have FDA-approved indications um, and are used um, in the clinic today. Tumor mutational burden is really emerging. There are many labs that are reporting this. Um, however, it's still not widely available, but there's new data and evidence coming out really every month for its utility. This is obviously a very hot, active area of investigation. Um, so many different groups are looking at various different modalities of trying to find additional biomarkers that might help us stratify patients for these therapies, and we'll talk about a few of these. So TMB, uh, very simply, is just the measurement of the number of mutations that exist within a tumor. More specifically, it's the number of mutations that exist within the coding region of a tumor um, genome or exome. And it's usually thought of as the burden of non-synonymous mutations in an exome. So these are mutations that are going to actually produce the change in the protein structure. Um, and it's often reported as the number of mutations per megabase. However, some studies report it as mutations per exome, so you kind of have to be careful um, when you're looking at some of these numbers. However, there is a current lack of standardization regarding TMB. Um, various labs and groups are calculating it differently using different platforms. Um, and this is also really an active area of collaboration and investigation, trying to come up with ways to standardize the calculation and reporting of TMB. So there's just mounting evidence um, that TMB is a useful biomarker. Some of the initial studies we're looking at, it is a biomarker in these immune checkpoint inhibitors that we've discussed in melanoma and lung cancer. However, there's increasing data in a variety of tumor types that we continue to see. And so the rationale for why this is a biomarker is similar to why MSI and mismatch repair deficiency is a good biomarker for immunotherapy, and that the larger number of mutations that you have, some of these are actually going to end up being expressed as altered protein structures, and these peptides are going to be processed, and at least a subset of them will be loaded onto the MHC for recognition by the immune system as a novel antigen that the immune system hasn't seen before. So the larger number of mutations you have to start with, the greater number of neoantigens you're going to generate and have the stronger immune system recognition of the tumor. Um, and in fact, there is evidence showing that the number of mutations that we see um, has a correlation with the number of predicted binding epitopes that are generated and recognized by the immune system. So one might ask if this is just a surrogate for neoantigens that are being generated, why aren't we using predicted neoantigens as a biomarker. And so calculating neoantigens um, is a much more difficult task. Um, it requires a lot of the neoantigens that are generated aren't necessarily part of um, tumor-targeted panels that we'd be doing. They're non-cancer-related genes. 
Um, and so you really need to look more broadly, so whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing. Um, and which ones are going to be loaded and presented on the MHC depends on the patient's HLA type, so you need to know HLA type of the patient. Um, and then RNA sequencing is also helpful to try to figure out which of these mutations are actually expressed. And so because of this, tumor mutational burden is a nice surrogate that's more approachable for use in the clinic and is actually performs quite well. So if you look at tumor mutational burden across tumor types here, this is tumors sorted from the left to right, from those that have the lowest average tumor mutational burden to those that have the highest here on the right. Um, you can see this y-axis is the TMB and its mutations from megabase, and note this is a log scale. So you can see across tumor types, there's a wide range of average TMBs that you'll see. And then even within a given tumor type, for example, in colorectal cancer, you can see there's a large range just within a single tumor type. And you can notice a few trends in general. Um, adult solid tumors um, that are associated with environmental exposure, such as smoking or UV exposure, these tend to have a higher TMB than a variety of other tumor types. And importantly, if you were to define uh, what high TMB is, and for the sake of argument, let's say here that it's a little over 10 mutations per megabase, that although there is a wide variety and range of TMBs across tumor types, at least a subset of many or most tumor types will have some tumors that fall into this high TMB range, suggesting that this might be a biomarker that could have utility um, across a variety of different tumors. And so in thinking about this in context to MSI, which we just discussed, um, as we saw some nice data showing that MSI tumors have very high mutation rates, um, so what is TMB actually contributing? Are we just also identifying the MSI high cases? And you can see, in fact, there is a very large overlap. Most MSI high tumors will also have a high TMB, but there's a larger number of additional cases that will have a high TMB that aren't secondary to the MSI phenotype. And this overlap really depends based on which tumor type you're looking at. So for example, the overlap is higher in colorectal cancer. So this is some, um, one of the many studies. This is looking at non-small cell lung cancer, and this is um, combination immunotherapy, so looking at CTLA-4 plus PD-1 blockade um, in patients just with high TMB. And for this particular study, high TMB was considered 10 mutations per megabase. And you can see those patients that received the combination immunotherapy had much better progression-free survival um, than those that received chemotherapy. And like some previous data that we saw in head and neck cancer, uh, what was really interesting about this is this um, rang true still in the patients had negative pd one expression. So the patients that had less than 1% pd one expression responded really well to the combination immunotherapy um, in addition to those that had high pd one expression. So this is increasing um, amounts of data showing that pd one and TMB can really function as independent biomarkers and are you know, identifying different subset of patients um, that might be responsive to these drugs. And I really like this figure. I think it gets across a really nice point in that this is looking at a variety of different tumor types uh, um, with various immune checkpoint inhibitors and looking at their objective response rate in contrast to the median number of mutations that you see in that tumor type. And in general, the tumors that tend to have a higher tumor mutational burden respond better to immunotherapy, but there are quite a few outliers, and I think it's important to keep those in mind when you think about TMB as a pan-tumor biomarker. So for example, colorectal cancer, like we just saw some data, Colon cancer that is mismatch repair intact um, tend to not respond very well to immunotherapy despite having a moderate TMB score. Um, and then there's some tumor types that have lower TMB, such as renal cell carcinomas, that tend to respond better than you would have guessed based on their TMB. So there are definitely some outliers, and it's important to keep this in mind um, when think thinking about TMB across tumor types. So how do we calculate this? So all the original studies that looked at TMB did tumor normal matched whole exome sequencing. Um, and so this has really been considered the gold standard for coming up with a TMB score. And so any other way of calculating it really needs to show some sort of correlation with this method. Um, however, most clinical laboratories aren't doing matched tumor normal whole exome sequencing um, on a clinical basis. And so there's a desire to try to figure out if we can get this um, number by using targeted cancer panels, panels that are already being run in many labs today. And so there's some data suggesting that for at least the larger size panels, so in this particular figure, a 300 gene panel um, has a pretty 
um, decent correlation with whole exome sequencing, but the smaller panels you get in the more hotspot focused panels of 50 genes, 15 genes, those don't have a very good correlation as you might imagine. You're just sampling less of the genome to try to get this number. And here's some data looking at head-to-head -head sequencing of about 29 samples um, to calculate TMB with whole exome sequencing with match normal. And depending on this particular exome was around 50 megabases in size compared to a targeted tumor-only panel, and this was foundation one, which is a little over one megabase in size. And you can see that there is a nice correlation. It's not a perfect R-squared value, but many people find this correlation to be good enough to say, okay, we can come up with a TMB score based on this smaller targeted panel. We don't need to do a whole exome sequencing of tumor and normal um, to come up with this score. And so what are some remaining questions with TMB? Many of these have maybe popped in your head in, in some of the slides that I've been going over. And so what is a high TMB and how do we define it? Um, and depending on the study you look at, it's gonna be different. Um, some studies have shown, for example, around 200 mutations for exome. Some have defined it by the median for that particular cohort. Um, 10 mutations per megabase was that one study I showed you. And are there questions, um, should it be dependent on tumor type? Because I showed you there's a wide range of TMBs depending on tumor type, or should there be one number that's used for all tumors? So I think a lot of these questions are still remain to be um, elucidated, and more data is really needed to answer a lot of these. Um, and then what size targeted panel is suitable for TMB calling? I showed you some data suggesting that maybe a 300, 400 gene panel around a megabase might be okay, um, but what about a lab that has 150 gene panel? Is that going to be big enough? Um, and I think in general, in the field, people are pretty comfortable with around a megabase of territory or more, um, and things smaller than that, I know people are trying to use, but it kind of still remains to be seen um, how good that correlation is gonna be. And then if you're not doing match normal sequencing, which again, most clinical cancer labs aren't doing match normal sequencing, um, how should you filter ger rare germline variants? Because um, that can really affect your TME calculation. And that can be kind of tricky. And then what kinds of variants should we count to do the TME calculation? This is also being done differently by different group groups. Should you only include um, changes to protein structure? Should you include missense changes or frame shift changes? Um, and so this is also yet to be defined. And then how should labs go about validating their existing panels for doing performing TMB testing? Does it require everyone running 50 match tumor normal exomes? That's obviously a very costly and difficult procedure. And so these are kind of still a lot of the questions that are still being developed and fleshed out. Um, and then another one that's really important to think about, now that we think of using TMB perhaps as a biomarker for first-line therapy, um, turnaround time becomes an issue. Um, so while it might not necessarily be a separate test, um, we can maybe incorporate it into our existing NGS panels, um, but maybe a two to three week turnaround time isn't gonna be acceptable for oncologists for first-line <coughs> therapy. So this might require some changes to many laboratory workflows and how we batch and run things as well. So looking at some other biomarkers um, beyond TMB, there's quite a few investigational ones, many of them looking at the immune cell repertoire diversity, uh, whether looking at tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or myeloid-derived suppressor cells, um, looking at T-cell clonality, um, and some also exciting data is coming out looking at composite biomarkers, so combining many of these together. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of these. One of them, and we saw a little bit of data of this earlier, is looking at immune gene expression profiles. So this particular one is looking at an interferon gamma-related mRNA profile that predicts response to PD-1 blockade. They came up with an 18-gene T-cell inflamed gene expression score. Um, this was derived using a variety of different tumor types. The data shown here is in particular looking at head and neck cancer, but you can see it kind of segregates out the patients that responded and didn't respond. And in this curve here, it's shown to have a superior performance to pd one expression by immunohistochemistry. So looking at gene expression profiles um, has a lot of interest and promise for being a useful biomarker. And then as we've seen quite a bit of data, um, TMB and pd one can perhaps be used together in complementary biomarkers um, because they really can function as independent, particularly in some of the tumor types, such as lung cancer, as shown here. And so for first-line non-small cell lung cancer, obviously the treatment algorithms are really evolving, but perhaps you can perform both TMB and pd one and that can really help um, 
direct what um, therapy can be given. And finally, I think um, there's a lot of really neat data in looking at multiplexed um, protein-based expression and immunohistochemistry in addition to generating really beautiful images such as these. And so, like we saw earlier in a lot of the data, there's a lot of different of these immune checkpoint inhibitors and these pathways they're putting on the brakes. So can you look at many of them all at once in the same cell? Can you look at the inflammatory cells at the same time? And can you see how they're actually interacting with each other, the stroma and the immune cell repertoire and the tumors, and kind of look at it all at once to get a better picture of what's going on? And there's a lot of really exciting data um, here as well. So to summarize, TMB is a promising new biomarker associated with response to immune checkpoint inhibitors in several different tumor types. Um, and TMB doesn't necessarily have to be a separate test. It can be incorporated into a lot of current existing um, NGS-based cancer panels. And it can be complementary to pd one and perhaps most useful as, as a composite biomarker. However, there's still a lot of questions remain um, as what the best method to calculate it is, what's the appropriate cutoff criteria, um, how is it going to be used clinically? And then biomarkers in general for immunotherapy is a very hot area of active investigation with a lot of different modalities being um, looked into, including composite biomarkers. And so we'll all have to stay tuned um, for all the exciting advancements. Right now what we're going to do is uh, our iPads are collected with all of your different uh, questions and what I'd like to do is just sort of turn it over, we'll all sit next to each other here and um, kind of go up and down uh, addressing questions, we'll just sort of pick them off here. Um, I'll take the first one here, I'll read it to you, it says, can MSI be assessed by a CT DNA? Um, I believe that the future is, the answer to that is yes. And um, uh, Dr. Ritterhaus, do you have anything else to, it's not, to us, to me, it's only available in an experimental manner, uh, but I think it will be a future. Dr. Ritterhaus, comments? Yeah, there's several, um, we don't perform it in-house, but there's several commercial laboratories that are offering this as part of their circulating tumor DNA panel. And if, I mean, the limitations with it are the same with other circulating tumor DNA, if there's a large volume tumor burden of disease and it's widely metastatic, you have a higher chance of picking up tumor DNA in the circulation. Um, so if you find MSI, it's helpful. If you don't find any evidence of mutations in the blood, you still don't know if the tumor is MSI high or not because it just might not be shedding at a high enough volume to pick it up. So um, it can be helpful, especially if you are out of tissue and it's kind of your only option. It can be useful for screening, but I think a negative test doesn't really rule it out. And it's not very widely available yet either. Dr. Ferris, the question you'd like to address? Yeah, and I, I was going to say I don't like the circulating DNA because then I don't get to work with my pathologist as well. <laughs> <laughs> I really prefer, prefer to keep the business in-house. So um, the question here is um, regarding HPV status, which uh, many of you may know is uh, responsible for about half of head and neck cancers, and the others are HPV negative, more carcinogen exposed. And few recent studies have shown a few recent studies have shown that high TMB is associated with clinical benefit in HPV negative tumors, but not HPV positive ones. So, what's the role of the viral antigens? Uh, and the the question ends: Why would HPV positive patients do worse on a checkpoint inhibitor? So, I will contest that just a little bit. Um, data from the pembrolizumab trials, which are um, single arm trials. Uh, and one of the ASCOs implied that HPV-positive patients did better. The next ASCO, the same trial, had an expansion cohort, and the HPV-negative ones did better. To me, my conflict of interest, of course, is I ran the phase three trial with nivolumab, but if you look, the hazard ratios are identical, whether you're HPV-positive or HPV-negative. So I think the data to date suggests that HPV-positive and negative uh, do the same. The kinetics you get an earlier response with the HPV positive ones, but the overall survival, if you follow them for a couple years, uh, is the same. And um, I, you know, I agree with Dr. Ritterhouse, the um, Liz Jaffe's New England Journal paper where the TMB was plotted. Um, it's a great figure, except for the part about head and neck and cervical and anal cancer, where TMB doesn't take into account viral antigens. So if you add in viral antigens to head and neck, anal, cervical, which we know, are not just TMB driven, then you get to bump up the response rate because you have the non-self viral and the TMB. So it's a little more complicated than just HPV status. And 
at least in Pittsburgh, most of our HPV positive patients are smokers too. They're not never smokers. You know, we try to dichotomize the disease, but we have most are actually smokers, so you have a TMB along with the viral antigens. Okay, great. Dr. Ritterhaus, one that you'd like to address? Yes. Um, one of these is how many genes should be investigated in TMB assay to be considered adequate? Um, I kind of briefly alluded to this. I could go into the details of this for an, an, several other hours, which would bore everyone to death. But um, I think most people feel very comfortable. And again, it's more about the megabases that is covered than the number of genes. But roughly, you know, you could say a 300 to 400 gene panel, most people would agree with is gonna be adequate. Um, and the problem is, is you start losing, if you're trying to identify a cutoff of something that's quite high, 20 mutations per megabase, that's easier to do with a smaller panel. So you might be able to get away with 170 genes if all you need to do is find things that are greater than 20 mutations per megabase. But if you wanna find something that's five mutations or 10 mutations per megabase, you really need a much larger panel of at least 300 to 400 genes. Okay, great. I have a question here. It says, uh, since IHC uh, for MMR is you know, more efficient, um, if that's positive, is it really necessary to do TMB? Uh, again, I, I, I think however you wish to establish the MMR, MSI status, uh, whatever your lab is good at, however you like to send it out, whatever your, some places want both. Um, but it's whatever, whatever your clinical colleagues uh, require. But yeah, I mean, if, if the MMR IHC nails it, then uh, you're, you know, that's, that's very positive. Yeah, I don't think TMB would necessarily be uh, needed. When, when I can, uh, mm -hmm. I think is a good question. Uh, as the field has begun to mature, I don't think we're quite there yet, but it's matured enough that multiple antibodies are approved, uh, and then each of them was done with a different pdl one clone. So this question is, can you uh, elucidate on which tumors to do TSP versus CSP and which clones of pd one testing are recommended? Um, I, I think it comes back to Dr. Andrew's point. You work with your clinician. Um, you know, some oncologists are sort of Nevo people. Others are Pembro. Still others are Derva. If they participated in the trial, they're a little bit more comfortable with whatever test was integrated into that trial. But I think as a... Uh, oncologists, we would uh, certainly respect our pathologist choice in that if you feel more comfortable interpreting a particular antibody. Uh, to me, they're the only kind of exception to that, um, I think there's only one antibody that's really been validated specifically on the stromal, uh, I think it's the, the uh, uh, atezolizumab uh, data, the Genentech, uh, is actually geared specifically toward the uh, stromal inflammatory cells. Um, but I think what we're finding is that an antibody will be used at a particular institution and a composite score potentially read out, but it wasn't necessarily validated for the TPS. So there is a little bit of nuance there for how an antibody was used in the particular phase three trial. But now that institutions and departments and oncologists are getting comfortable mixing and matching because we have so many different approvals, I think it's an open question about which antibody to use. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is driven by what was the FDA approved and what the FDA says the scoring system is. Um, CPS is primarily gastric cancer. TPS is almost everything else. It's a little bit arguable about what bladder is. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Ritterhaus is the one that you'd like to address? Sure. Um, there's one talking about asking that whether some of the TMB high data response is driven by the fact that a subset of those will be MSI high, and that's really driving the response. And I think that um, can partially be dependent on tumor type. If you look at the data, for example, in non-small cell lung cancer, um, MSI is incredibly uncommon. Um, it's quite rare. So um, the fact that TMB high in lung cancer is associated with a good response, very few to, I, d I don't know in that one particular study if any of them were MSI high. So I think for in s many tumor types, that's not going to be the case just because of the rarity of MSI high in those tumors. So I do think it is being driven by a separate mechanism other than MSI. Okay, there's, um, there's a sort of a straightforward one. Do both MMR and MSI predict response to immune therapy? The answer would be yes, that we believe that they have the equal uh, performance. 
Um, there are nuances in how these, which sort of samples these tests are better for and which ones they're not. Um, but um, they're both uh, equal, equally predictive. Um, Dr. Ferris? Yeah, there was uh, a question here, which I think is a good one. Um, are neoantigens just biomarkers for immune checkpoint therapy, or can we actually have immunotherapy against the uh, neoantigens themselves? And um, the answer is yes. Uh, there are a lot of platforms and companies that are trying to take tissue, uh, do the sequencing, do exomes, then sequence the HLA, do the prediction, uh, and make new neoantigen-based vaccines. Uh, the biggest problem is that's about a six-week process, and so there's been technical hurdles. I think the field has to move forward, and our prediction al algorithms need to get a bit better. Um, the flip side of that is adoptive T-cell therapy, where you remove the lymphocytes from the tumor that theoretically are neoantigen-specific. You don't have to know what the neoantigen is, but theoretically you're targeting them by expanding those lymphocytes and then transferring them back. Both approaches... Um, which, you know, I would argue are kind of signal one immunotherapies as opposed to the immune checkpoints, kind of signal two, take off the brakes, are currently being tested in clinical trials, but it's really a kind of a bioinformatic and a time frame uh, logistical issue. Okay, great. Right. Um, here's one. It's why do we care about microsatellite instability when we can just sequence the mismatch repair genes? Um, so for several reasons, one, um, a lot of the mismatch repair that we see, particularly in colon and endometrial cancer, a large number of that is due to epigenetics. So for example, MLH1 promoter methylation, which is the common pattern we see of loss of MLH1 and PMS2. So that's a somatic event that occurs that you wouldn't find anything by sequencing the mismatch repair gene and the most common cause of microsatellite instability. Um, outside of an inherited cancer setting. Um, and the other reason is PMS2 is a horrendous gene to sequence. No one does it very well. It has, you know, great, has greater than 15 pseudogenes, and so it's actually very, very difficult to sequence PMS2 with any sort of success. So um, there's a lot of downsides to just sequencing the mismatch repair genes, and it's much easier to do either immunohistochemistry or PCR or NGS. Okay. Did somebody ask a question that... Um I wanted to ask my colleagues up here, too. Um, Dr. Gallon suggested a tumor um, immune score. They said immune staging. I uh, actually like immune staging better than immune score. In addition to TNM staging, is it going to happen? Yeah. You might I, say, when is it going to happen? Yeah, yeah, no, I, that, yeah, whoever, uh, was, that was the one I wanted to address. Um, I mean, you showed data with that CD8 density was important, um, and it seems like, you know, even the, some of the tumors that we're looking into, things that aren't published, that lymphocyte densities are, are, can be predictive as well as prognostic, and certainly Dr. Galan has been saying that for a long time. Um, the, the thing has been really for us as pathologists, the immune score to, um, uh, is cumbersome. Um, it's not something that we can necessarily adopt. The, the algorithms are not transparent or available to us. Uh, it's essentially a send-out test. Uh, so I think that's, that's inhibited its penetrance, but it's also preserved the power uh, of, of the test because uh, Jerome has been very careful to make sure it is instituted correctly. So essentially what you have is a, is a patented technique um, and I think it's going to come from patient demand or oncologist demand uh, as we get more uh, experience with it. I know that uh, Jerome is setting up uh, in Virginia to be able to work as a send-out lab or a reference lab to perform the immune scores on different tumors. Um, so it's all a question of billability, too. So what would it take at least to have it listed on the synoptic that, that is one of the things that get read out. Uh, what are the standards in the pathology community to sort of implement, you know, what is on a standard pathology report? Is that a laborious process to go through, like, you know, changing the AJCC staging system it's yeah. every eight yeah. or 10 years? I mean, I think again, yeah, I mean, AJCC, you know, is sort of standard of care at the moment. The issue here is really that there's only one place in the world that can do it. Um, and I'm not, I, you know, I don't really know if, 
you know, there's 200,000 colon cancers diagnosed each year I don't, in the U.S. I don't, I don't know if the lab can do all of them. Um, I, there's one question talking about lungs, I believe, squamous cell carcinoma, um, saying it usually doesn't have a lot of the current drivers that we see in adenocarcinoma, so do we really need to look at these multiple targets and genes? Um, and I can say at our institution, um, we haven't in the past routinely tested squamous cell carcinomas, only if there was kind of, if it was called non-small cell lung cancer, it would get tested. Um, but now with TMB, um, our oncologists want it tested to get a TMB score, not necessarily for all the other targets, but just for the TMB score. Um, so that's really new in the last couple months. We've started having conversations with them about starting to um, send the squamous cell carcinomas. It's actually all of our lung cases, the molecular is ordered by the pathology team, not by the oncologists. We have an agreement with them. So we're discussing, considering ordering those. Um, the question now is whether the test will be reimbursed or not. Um, we don't know, but. Okay, um, let's we'll go through one more, um, one more round here. Um, I'm gonna take, should we do MMR, on, MMR testing on all cancers? Should we do PDL one testing on all cancers? It's IHC, um, pathologists are comfortable with that. Um, I don't think we should be doing PDL1 on all, necessarily on all tumors. Um, it's not necessarily going to be billable. And if it's not one of the cancers that the oncologists are using uh, to change their thinking, it, it's, it's probably not useful. Um, and the data for it as a prognostic factor is it's kind of checkered. It's not very clear. Right. Right, it's very tumor type dependent as a prognostic feature. So I, d I don't think we're at that stage yet. The other thing is the, the immunohistochemistry chemistry really hasn't been worked out on all the different tumor types and, unless you want to run it as a, you know, as a sort of independent IHC test. Uh, should we do MMR on all cancers? I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think we, we as, as, uh, 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 as, as laborians have the ability to do that. <laughs> Um, which is making it very difficult when you have approval for uh, a treatment for 12 different types of cancers. Um, you know, the, like I had mentioned, does that mean every prostate should get run through? I'll, hear, I'll tell you that the <coughs> prostates that are MMR deficient are extremely lymphocyte rich and will definitely catch your attention. Uh, but I would desperately like someone to do a study at least trying to t cue us in to uh, to, to what types of cancers are more likely to be mismatch repair uh, uh, deficient. Okay. Uh, there was this uh, question about whether multicolor flow could be used to characterize the tumor microenvironment uh, and, and is it because of fresh tissue that's the drawback? Well, I, I think that multiplex uh, fluorescence, Dr. Anders and, and their team have really been uh, pioneers, is getting more and more comprehensive, and uh, part of the data for lymphocyte infiltration is not just quantity, but it's having it, um, you know, invading the tumor, and you, you lose that when you uh, try to digest and do flow. So I would say no, uh, we prefer to have multiplex uh, tissue staining, and you get more geographic distribution. Plus it keeps Dr. Anders busy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. All right, one more, Dr. Ritterhouse, please. Sure. Um, so someone is curious how we use our FNA samples for NGS and how they're processed. So we use um, most of these are involved that we have works for outside material as well, but on-site pathology evaluations. So we use air-dried smears that are diff-quick stained, um, and they work really nicely. Um, we evaluated several other um, ethanol fixed tissue works really well for molecular studies as well, but we've found the diff quick to be really nice. And then um, we actually have on-site evaluation for not just tissue adequacy, but molecular adequacy for all the lung cancer specimens. So we know that it, the specimen that we're getting to test, in addition to the diagnostic specimen, is adequate for testing as well. And it's really improved our um, rates of the percent of specimens that we're actually able to get enough DNA and complete testing on. Okay, great. All right, so um, with that, I would like to thank our uh, panelists here, and most of all, thank you for your attention uh, and the excellent questions. Uh, some of us, if, if we don't have other engagements, we'll be able to hang around here and answer your questions if we weren't able to get to them. And uh, thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thank you for listening.
Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash UZM. This activity is supported through independent educational grants from AstraZeneca, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Foundation Medicine Incorporated. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.